Thank you all for the great welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew, and uh, thank you for having me. Today I'm going to talk to you about life in the polar oceans, but really I'm going to talk to you about life in the Antarctic Ocean and how different and similar it is to oceans the rest of the world over. Now, when most people think about the Antarctic, they probably think of a few words. I usually think of cold, ice, windy. It's the highest, driest, windiest place on the planet is what they call it. And it can be a quite harsh environment with, for example, in this picture you have an active volcano coming down into the ocean which is frozen over with four to seven feet of ice in this particular picture, as well as glaciers sculpting the volcanic landscape. It doesn't look very happy to live. And although there's a thousand different shades of white, it tends to be fairly monochromatic with white, black, and every once in a while you'll see some spectacular blues. And that's the surface of the land there. What makes it special is it's very far south. I work at about 78 degrees south. And for five months of the year, you essentially, this is midnight. It's 24 hours of daylight. Then there's a month of sunrise and sunset. This is the first time the sun's been seen in six months in the Antarctic continent this past year. And again, here we have a frozen ocean, ice dictating a lot of the surface biology and, or lack thereof. And then for the rest of the time, you have pitch black, no light, no sun, no energy for plants or animals to try to capture in addition to what can really be called cold. Every once in a while, you see some nice uh, aurora australis, which you're seeing here, but mostly it's dark and bitter on the surface of essentially the ocean as I see it. To just get you a little bit uh, oriented, this is the Antarctic continent. Here's southern uh, Chile and Argentina. Here's New Zealand. And here's where I work, Ross Island, which is blown up right here. And the reason why I work here is it's the southernmost place on the planet where somebody can get in the water and study the ocean. It has incredible seasonality, and that's really what this talk is going to be about, is the incredible seasonality and how that shapes life in the ocean. The other word people often think of when they think of the Antarctic are penguins. They're some of the most adorable and ridiculous creatures on the planet. But what makes them really special is the emperor penguins especially, in addition to the Waddell seal, which you can see here, are the only two animals that are visible on the surface of the ice that far south throughout the winter. There's other species that come down in the height of summer, but still you're going to max out at about 10 or 15 species of animal in the environment that we normally think of as being populated by animals. The rest of it, the only color is those that we bring from orange, quite old, but very functional snowmobiles. And desolation is a thought that often comes through. There's not much to look at as soon as you get away from the mountain ranges. This is the polar plateau that extends all the way to the South Pole. It's white. However, when you look below the surface, you see an entirely different environment. You don't have this incredible seasonality of wind and storm. Instead, you have a very constant, and although not warm, compared to the atmosphere, a not that cold temperature. The water in the Antarctic is uh, minus 1.8 Celsius or 28 degrees Fahrenheit and has been for thousands of years. So unlike the surface that has this extreme weather conditions caused by those seasons, there's actually an incredible stability as soon as you get below that thick layer of ice, which you can see here, and how that impacts the benthos, which is the seafloor in the communities, is one of the things that I study. Now that was a, this is a huge sponge, and in fact sponges are one of the animals that you see very abundant in the Antarctic. This is a field of sponges on the top of a seamount that comes up and just peers out just into the photic zone, and this essentially one species covers the entire top of this mountain. This sponge is the size of me. It's actually not a very large specimen down there, but it's a very large sponge for most places on the planet. But the other reason why I'm showing you this photo is the things that are kind of unique in the Antarctic also tie in to these animals here. Sea stars are the dominant predators. It's not fish like you think in other places or other large animals. It's sea stars. They're voracious. They'll eat each other if you touch them the wrong way. The other animals you see are sea urchins as well as these things which are murdy and worms, and I'll tell you more about them in a minute. But sponges come back as one of the most important fauna in the Antarctic, partially because they're huge. This one's only about half as big as me, but they can be ginormous. This is uh, in 1968 when some of the first divers went down. This is Gordy Rebellier. The photo was taken by Paul Dayton. They were some of the first people to see this. I think like anybody who sees something like this, they have to ask, can I fit in it? Yeah. The, an <laughs> the answer is yes. We found out later it's really bad for the sponges to do this, so we don't do it anymore. But the sponges were essentially the size of a human. 
The other thing we found out is that they grow incredibly slowly. This sponge, as well as these sponges, were tagged in 1968, one of the first things they did down there. They went back in 1989 and they remeasured it, and they didn't grow at all. So we have no idea how old they are. They could be 100 years, they could be 1,000 years. We're essentially have two points that are completely the same, and you can do whatever you want with an extrapolation to that, but any way you look at it, it's old. We also know that they don't show up all that often. If you have something that they can settle on, if they don't show up every single year. It's not like there's a new influx of these sponges. Over about a 30-year period, we had one big recruitment event or appearance of these sponges in the Antarctic, and so we just don't know much about the population of these sponges, but we do know they're huge, old-lived, and they don't show up all that often. We think there may be a lot of sponges in the Antarctic from this picture. First off, all these little dots here, these are different kinds of sponges. There's some other different animals in the background. This is a, a sponge that's, again, only about half my size. But they may be able to survive really well in the Antarctic because they can deal with the incredible water clarity and the complete lack of food. Now, for scale, here's a dive hole. That's about four feet across. Uh, we do a lot of diving there. We use down lines to make sure we can find the hole. There's strobes on that. But what's important about this photo is I'm about 150 feet away from that hole. And yet, I don't know about you, but I can't see anything in the water column from here to there. The visibility in the water column is spectacular. A bad day is about 300 to 500 feet. A good day, you can see mountain ranges in the distance. The sponges themselves provide a lot of ecological roles in addition to just eating things. Here's some little um, isopods that live in amongst the sponge structure. Fish lay eggs in them. Fish use them as refugia. They can be quite important to the polar habitat. We do get some, some sorts of species that we see elsewhere on the globe, see octopods, things like that. They're pretty rare. Um, fish, though, are kind of like the animals on the surface. I am an invertebrate vertebra biologist, so I'm very biased on this. There's one to seven species of fish that you can find in the shallows there, which is far lower diversity than we see off the coast here. And this is the main one. This guy's name is Trematomus bernacchii. But most of the fauna that's really important are invertebrates and are more these sea stars that are kind of driving the communities and how these ecosystems function. Things get large other than sponges. This is a pycnogonid. It's a sea spider. Don't worry, it doesn't have fangs. It's not poisonous unless you're a sponge. Um, but it's about this big. They're incredibly slow moving. Um, and if you poke them, they have very few responses to predators. They just kind of curl up into a little ball and don't know what to do. Um, but they can be pretty striking. And one of the things, this isn't the best photo for it, but if you look right there, one of the interesting things is they have a single stalk with four lenses on it, so they can see 360 degrees at once. Again, you'll see that there's a dive hole in many of my photos, because I always want to remember where that is. <laughs> and that's my dive buddy. I'm getting to that. <laughs> These are the Nemertians. I am a uh, connoisseur of worms. I love almost all worms. And these are some of the most revolting things I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> these are essentially swimming intestines. They've got a mouth and another end, and they make slime. However, they can be seven feet long in the Antarctic. And if you create some sort of disturbance or put some food down there, they come crawling across and swimming through the ocean like nothing else. Um, one of the challenges is actually not being too revolted when you put something in the Antarctic water because if you put a cage down, they'll wriggle themselves through. And so when you pull up the cage, you're picking up essentially a huge ball of slime filled with these worms. This is a, uh, it looks like a cockroach. It's an isopod. It's called Glyptonotus. One of the really nice things is things don't really move that fast down there. And so this little guy kind of crawls along the seafloor. I say little guy. He's about this big. Um, but they're very kind of docile. And one of the more endearing facts is they raise their young on their legs. So here's a baby glyptonotus on its mama or daddy glyptonotus. You also get a lot of deep sea creatures that come up to the shallows, partially because of this stability. This is a crinoid. It's uh, related to sea stars and sea urchins. And the only other place you find them really shallow, except in some tropical locations, is fjords, which also have these incredibly kind of constant and cold temperatures. The other fauna that's really common are all sorts of cnidarians, especially anemones. This is a relatively large one. They can carpet the seafloor, though, and this is what the carpet looks like up close. Little octocoral, and they can be quite dramatic. This is the entire seafloor covered by a few sponges and thousands? Your estimate's as good as mine 
on the number of those little anemones covering the seafloor. I often get asked what it's like to dive in the Antarctic, and I have to say the water is so much more pleasant than the air, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, this is what one of the ice holes that we often use looks like. You can see our downline, but the question is how did we make these ice holes, and there's a variety of different ways we do it. Uh, but first, I'll go over a little bit of the dive gear that we use. You'll notice this is me. Um, that's me scared going in the hole. But we use kind of the same dive gear somebody would use off the coast here. There's a few very small differences. We wear more polar fleece underneath the dry suit than you would pretty much anywhere else on the globe. Our gloves here are entirely in, uh, connected to the suit, so our hands stay dry on a good dive. On a bad dive, they stay wet, and we come up very unhappy because uh, it's essentially putting your hand in an ice bucket for 45 minutes. And then the other nuance is we have these two completely separate and redundant regulators. The only dive gear that really has issue in the Antarctic are these regulators. After sometimes a relatively short, a relatively long time in the water, they'll actually freeze up. And when they freeze up, they dump all the air out of your tank, which is a bad thing. So we found out that if you have two completely separate regulators, if one starts to fail, it's pretty obvious. You turn it off. You have the other regulator to go tell your dive buddy that unfortunately the dive is over. This is a regulator that came out in 1989. I think it was produced until 1991. Turns out to be the best regulator that, working in, that works in the Antarctic. They've tried other styles, and styles specifically designed for the Antarctic have somewhere around a 50% failure rate. Uh, this particular one has a 0.01% failure rate. It's only failed on me once. Do you want us to do the same thing there as it does here, I'm assuming? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Diving under the influence is frowned upon in the Antarctic <laughs> program. <laughs> it's, a pro it's a dry suit company in uh, San Diego that makes really good dry suits, although there's a variety of good dry suit companies. I'm also wearing three hoods there, and you can see that one of which covers essentially all my skin. The only thing that is exposed are my lips, and they go numb immediately, so it doesn't even seem cold. So you get out of the water, and you try to drink something and spill your hot chocolate right down the front of yourself. So there's a variety of different ways that we can make a hole in the ice. This is how the Waddell seals survive the winter, is they sit there and they chew the ice with their teeth. It's why they're one of the shortest lived uh, pinniped species, because they essentially wear out their teeth, and when their teeth are worn out, they can no longer breathe, and that's the end of that particular individual. Well, they have to chew a hole in the ice because they live in the water, and so if they can't get to the surface, they can't get air, and that's the end of them. Yep. We instead have one of the most wonderful inventions I've ever seen. This is a reed drill with a not very small bit on it. This is a four foot wide bit. And if used right, you can drill a hole through up to 12 feet of ice in under five minutes. A perfectly circular hole too, so there's nothing to kind of block it. If we're too far away from the station to use that really, really wonderful drill, uh, we have to use other techniques. We can melt it using a very slow and painstaking process. We can use dynamite, uh, and I say we, meaning we hire people who know how to use dynamite, because no, no wise person would give a scientist dynamite. <laughs> and then, ideally, we're diving out of a nice warm hut, because again, the air is cold. We're not always diving out of a warm hut. Sometimes we get towed to our dive site on the back of a, a snowmobile, and sometimes we just essentially get dropped off by a helicopter to camp in new locations when we're trying to figure out if it's a dive site or not. The good news is you burn a lot of calories uh, diving like this, and so you can eat cheesecake for four to seven meals a day. <laughs> <laughs> I was usually more on the five myself. But. And then the other thing is here's a small island that this ice is connected to, and it's, since that's frozen to the island, the tide is bringing up and lowering the ice, and it creates a crack that if you know the tides, you can dive in safely. We pretty much try to avoid this technique of diving. Um, and even this dive, we just looked in the hole, stuck our head, uh, said, got out, and said, nope. But once you get into the, the hole, it's a completely different story. I often get asked if it's claustrophobic in the hole, and the short answer is no. Because as soon as you go through that short bit of ice, you get treated to views like this. This is the sea ice surface. You can see the blues raining down through it. Right now it's early in the season, so it is blue light getting tinted by the ice. And again, you can see for miles. You can see the different levels of snow on the surface providing that different texture. 
And then when you look down at the seafloor, you see these pavements of large sponges. Here's sea stars that are eating the sponges. They're one of the predators of sponges. And then again, these little patches of anemones, large octocorals, again, like you'd see in the deep sea and not very common shallow. Um, it's dark because it's all the snow and ice blocks most of the light that comes through at this time of year. And you can essentially just see a very unique community on the seafloor. Now, the seafloor itself is one unique community, and then the water column also has a very intriguing community. This is one of these individuals. This is a tenophore, or comb jelly. You can see the little teens or combs running along its side, and it swims by rotating those. This guy's about this big, and he's a predatory one. And so this is his mouth, and he'll actually just chomp things out of the water column. But again, notice how clear the water is, and there's not much for him to chomp out of the water column. Uh, in that particular photo, I was just about 20 feet dip, deep. Our maximum diving depth is 130 feet, set by uh, the powers that be, which is great, because we don't have much working time there. Most of the dives are between 100, or between 60 and 100 feet for a reason I'll go into in a minute. I study mud, I study the seafloor. This is what most of my dives working actually look like, taking sections of the sediment community up to the lab to do, lab to do experiments on them. We're always treated to nice views of cracks. Cracks are important because you don't want to fall through a crack when you're not in a dry suit. Um, but also they can uh, provide different areas for seals to breathe and things like that. So if the cracks are open, the seals don't need to be chewing quite as much. This is a picture at the end of the dive. Here's the ice hole from the, the bottom looking up. And you see there's first off, and I'll point this out later, there's no color to this ice. It's early in the season, it's bright. And we also have this down line of flags to make sure we always find the hole. We're never really more than one big breath away from the hole in case anything goes wrong. And similar to diving here and other locations, we always have a dive buddy in close distance because safety is always a main concern, especially when you can't swim straight up from where you are. Later in the season, the visibility gets bad because the sun's been up for a while. You start getting communities growing on the ice. And we're also attached to the surface by a, a rope, so we always know which way to go out. Almost all the diving is done early in the season where we don't need to dive tethered because it's much easier to not have a rope to get tangled up in. Now, it, that brings us into seasonality, and that's really an incredible thing in the Antarctic because of that long time period of daylight, long time period of darkness. This figure is, a, this is essentially the end of summer. This color on the Antarctic continent is the amount of ice and the distribution of ice on the continent. And then this is winter. The continent actually doubles in size because of ice extending out at the, by the end of winter, and then most of that breaks out during the summer. Although stability was something I talked about underwater, ice can cause two different forms of instability. And this is one of the reason that we have to dive deep. This is called anchor ice. And it's each one of these little platelets is essentially grown on something sticking out of the sediment whether it be a sea urchin or the scallop. But the sea urchins are usually pretty quick, so they can avoid it. But everything less than, let's say, about 30 feet every year is frozen up, sucked up by these little balloons of ice and frozen into the overlying uh, sea ice and is killed. So we have nothing but very quick-moving animals in the shallows. If we want to study something that's been there for a long time, we're essentially limited to our shallowest depth at 60 feet. This is a video of some of the anchor ice. This is at the end of a glacial moraine. These boulders were dropped off a volcano by a glacier. And you can see that ice is really everywhere. This is at about 20 to 30 feet. And it extends up all the way to land right here. And if you've seen that David Attenborough video of the brinicle, those are some brinicles coming down. And they'll actually freeze animals on the seafloor uh, with supercooled water and also kill them. So that's one of the ways that ice really can structure the shallows. Now, deeper than that, the way that ice structures things is through um, more geologic forcing, so iceberg calving as well as glaciers themselves. This is a microbiology student in uh, OSU, essentially being my model. He was a much better model than I was a filmographer because I kept on losing him out of the frame. But he's swimming up to a wall of ice. This is the front of a glacier that's 100 feet tall, right where it hits a, uh, the seafloor. And he's shining his light on it just for scale. This is what it looks like looking down it. And so anytime you have this 
ice pushing, you're essentially destroying the vent or the seafloor community right in front of it, and it can definitely be a driving factor in what's present or not. One of the really exciting things is we've been to that dive site. Uh, I started going to the Antarctic in 2002, just got back, uh, I guess that's only been about four or five months ago from my last trip. When we look down for the first time at that glacier face, this is the front of that glacier. There's a stream of what appears to be fungus and bacteria getting forced out from underneath that glacier onto the seafloor. We have no idea what it is. It's one of the things we're going to study in upcoming years, but I just thought this picture was really neat. Some of the stuff we still don't know, but we'll stumble across when we go look. This is one of the photos I didn't take. I should have credit up there. Uh, Stacy Kim from Oscillating Marine Labs took it. And they're diving on an iceberg as it's grounding through the seafloor. For scale, here's a diver. And it essentially can plow through and destroy all of the life on the seafloor that takes decades to recover. This can happen down to 100 meters and deep. These can, glacier, icebergs can be gigantic and can be one of the other driving forces. Those are the two kind of ephemeral ice-driven impacts on the seafloor. But the other impacts, other than the stability, are really the seasonality and the amount of food. So here I have essentially three seasons worth of water column food. This is most of the year. So seven, eight months of the year, you have that crystal clear water that's so nice to dive in and makes pretty photos, I think. For a short period, just about a month, you have slightly murkier water, and then you have this incredible phytoplankton bloom providing food. This comes in from the ice edge. It doesn't even get formed locally. It gets swept under these ice and provides this kind of bolus of food for the animals on the seafloor to eat. Uh, so this, was a, this is the amount of food that is there Decem late December, early January. This is about um, mostly it's February, early February, and then this is kind of March through the end of August, beginning of September. Middle one is after the month. This is kind of in between. So this would be most of the year turns to this, turns to that, turns back to this, turns back to this. These are all cores next to each other, but I put the amount of food that's present in each one of those time periods. So there's an incredible change in the seasonality and the amount of food that's present. And I've been talking about why, how the Antarctic's unique from what we think about often as ecosystems. And so I think that brings up the question, well, why do you study it? Is it really important to study things that are unique? That's a, that is a good question, but the reason why I do it is it's actually a way to study things that are not unique. So I've color-coded the seafloor of the entire globe by those areas that are essentially deeper than 1,000 meters, which is the majority of the globe. It works out to about 60% of the globe, 60 to 63, depending on how careful you want to be with those 200 to 1,000 meter uh, depths. And the reason why I've color-coded it this is all of these environments have a, in a similar intense seasonality that's present. They don't get this constant rain of food down to the seafloor as we always thought. Instead, you get essentially single boluses of food, just like we do in the Antarctic. This is a, uh, Dave Billet at the University of Southampton took this, these photos in 1999 to 2000 and 2001. What you see is no food, no food, no food, no food, an amazing amount of food. And so the entire seafloor essentially sees the similar intense pulse of food and then nothing for a very long period of time. Now the reason it's easier to study the Antarctic compared to this is these depths are deep. They're 1,000, 4,000 meters at some of the shallower sites, and they go down to deeper. And we want to understand how these areas function. I'd also say that we often think that the water in the Antarctic is cold. It is cold. It's as cold as seawater gets. However, the average temperature of the planet in the ocean is about 4 degrees C. So it's only 6 degrees warmer. And if we try to learn how things are happening at something that's 10, 15, 20, 30 degrees C or the surface water, we're actually not really studying the normal. We're studying the shallows and the surface water. Whereas the Antarctic, we can get a much more kind of constant understanding of how the rest of the globe functions. The other thing we can get in the Antarctic is we can get an extreme environment that's going to be pushing our knowledge in how things work. And that's this community. This is my community of choice. I said I really like worms. I wasn't lying. The reason why I like this community is it's one of the densest on the planet, and yet it occurs with this incredible seasonality. There's about 150,000 of these worms and other community members in a square meter of the seafloor. To put that in context, a very high number for other places on the planet Shallow subtidal areas are about 70,000. If we look at 63% of the globe, and another challenge when we're looking at that, we're closer to thousands, 
maybe even less than that. So this is an environment that has an intense seasonality. Not that dissimilar temperature, although definitely those are key temperature changes, but really we can use it as a model to understand how most of the globe works. This is the worm up close. It's more endearing, I think, this way. <laughs> this is its tubes that they live in. It has these two little palps. You can see the blood running through them. And they essentially use these little palps or tentacles to grab food either out of the water column by waving them back and forth or picking food off the sediment and moving it into their mouth. Remember, in an area of this dense habitat, there's 150, or actually 100 to 150,000 of these in a square meter or square yard. They're not the only thing. There's an incredible biodiversity also in this community. And these are three different examples of little amphipods uh, that are also part of that. Now, that photosynthetic production or that algae I showed you in the water column isn't the only source of energy that's coming into these communities. We're working in the diver depths, so we're definitely under the influence of light. That can influence two different surfaces that we're not used to dealing with always in other locations, and one of those is the underside of the ice. If you remember back a little bit ago, I showed you ice that was perfectly white. That's early season ice. This is mid-season ice. You see these little streamers coming through, and those are ice communities within the algae that are harnessing that light and starting to grow. As the season continues, those start to break up, turn into darker, denser, richer communities, as you can see by the color here, until finally the ice is getting destroyed from essentially the warm water underneath, and that's causing large amounts of this algae to rain down and provide an additional food source on the seafloor. The other type is since we're shallow enough, we get ice or algae growing on the subsurface or the seafloor itself. And that's what you can see here. This brown are these diatoms, which are unicellular algae, and they're essentially growing, capturing the sun's rays, and turning into a source of food for the different worms that are present. This is a, one of those worm tubes that I showed you the video of earlier. There's also a few other unique things here. I should say common things here. These clams. This is a single-celled animal about, or it's a single-celled protist, not necessarily an animal. It's about the size of a pea, and there's essentially just a big sack that eats sediment and processes it. And if we do a very simple experiment, put down, capture the entire community, including all that ice algae and everything, all the worms, and we allow one access to sunlight and one no access to sunlight, we can quite simply see how much photosynthetic production is going on on the seafloor. And during that peak time of photosynthetic production in the Antarctic, that only accounts for about 25% of the energy that that entire community leads, needs. So one of the foci of my research is understanding the balance of all of these different food sources, and not only how the worms are able to survive, but how the worms, as well as bacteria, these little green dots are fluorescent bacteria that live in the sediment, how they compete to be able to persist and have this community that we know has been there since about 1967, 1968. Now, the reason most people get to the Antarctic is science. It is an area that's mostly dedicated to science. This is from Scott's Hut, and I believe is 1912 expedition. Um, showing science in the old days. And the reason why we work in the Antarctic is because we can do science in the new days. And each one of these little cores is a captured community from the sediment. We can give them different amounts of food. We can remove the microbial activity. We can change the communities. And we can see how they're able to persist and how much carbon they breathe back into the water column and how much they bury in the sediment. I said previously I really like worms. Uh, it's not always easy to convince people to also like worms. And so one of the aspect of my research is besides the actual research is trying to convince people to enjoy the different sorts of biodiversity and life in the, in the oceans. And although I think photos are a good way to do that, it's, there's no real better way than convincing or talking to artists about how to portray different biological concepts in a kind of exciting fashion. And so I worked with Lily Simonson, who's an artist in uh, Los Angeles-based area and sent her a bunch of Antarctic photos. She sent me back this one. This is a sponge from the Antarctic. She was really excited. But I was like, but I really want to try to have an image of worms living in some sort of uh, stasis and you know, enjoying the Antarctic environment as a focus of my research. And so I sent her this photo, which is essentially this ice algae that I showed you before. These are amphipods, slightly different ones than I showed you up close, but it's just essentially a swarm of animals that normally graze off this. You can see those sea stars, which are really dominating the seafloor at this shallow depth, so it's very ephemeral. And I said, can you put worms in this sort of context? And she came back with this. 
Um, here you can see the brinicles coming down. You can see worms. The little polychaetes that I showed you, here's them pointing out their tubes as well as a variety of different polychaetes. I think it's an interesting way to try to you know, incorporate a different group uh, or a different outlook on my research that I can't necessarily do myself. Plus it's all done in black light paint, so if you turn out the lights, it changes the mood. <laughs> so with that, I think I will end, and I'm really happy to take any questions uh, about any of this. I can talk more about my research, but. In Fahrenheit 28, yeah. 28 degrees, and it's been that way for thousands of years, so it's always that temperature. Uh, it does change in a fraction of temperature sometimes, but like 0.02 or 0.2, not much warmer. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you there typically, and how many dives would you be able to make? Would you make more than one a day or only a couple days? It depends how much cheesecake we're eating. Um, so the dive season is essentially two to three months because we try to dive every year where we don't need to dive on tethers. It's much easier. It's much safer. So we'll often be there from um, late August until December. One of the strangest things is that ice algae bloom that gets swept in from the uh, edge of the ice comes December 5th to December 7th every year. You can almost set a calendar to it. And so we try to leave by that point because it gets uh, more challenging to dive. Uh, we do one to two dives a day. We have done as many as three, but uh, we try to, since we're diving deep, we're off often kind of pushing, not really pushing, but we're in the point where we're paying attention to the amount of nitrogen in our blood, and we don't want to try to push that, even though there's a chamber there at some of the best trained staff if there was a diving accident. Well, you know, your basal temperature going down over a couple of weeks? Not a couple, a couple of weeks, because we warm up every day. You definitely notice it throughout a dive, and that's how you get cold on a dive. You don't feel cold. You start kind of feeling cold in your bones and you start shivering more than the fact that you think, I'm really cold now, and then you realize that you're really cold now and it's time to end a dive. We can dive for 50 minutes is kind of the max. Uh, we've dove, I've dove as much as 75 minutes, but that's when we are shallow enough in the science really we wanted to get it done. When we were riding on the back of those snow machines out to go to our site, it was two hours on the back of a snow machine to do an hour dive and then ride back, and the snow machine was so uncomfortable, we would do the longest dives possible because we didn't want to do it again the next day. You know, lose more temp, you know, that would drop more than maybe the rest of your body first. It does, and so what we can do is since there's a break between the suit and our gloves, we can actually put the warm air from our core into our gloves, and we can constantly do that to make sure that they don't have just the limited circulation that they normally do. Yeah. Has anyone tried cameras during the winter months to see what it looks like? Do, are any of these... Uh, features uh, self-luminous, for instance. So the question was, have any, has anybody put a camera down there over the winter months to see if anything self-luminous or bioluminescent? And uh, there are people that have overwintered and dived throughout the winter. That hasn't happened in a while. Um, and a lot of times the, they have such bright lights on that they don't notice. However, if there's an area that has a lot of snow cover on, them, on it, it essentially is no light. Uh, it's pitcher black than any night dive ever ever done anywhere else. And we had some sites that we were trying to look at that were exactly like that. Uh, and I can tell you, yes, there's actually a, quite a bit of bioluminescence that's down there. And it's things that we didn't expect to see bioluminesce. But we turned off our lights to see what would happen. And kind of the whole seafloor turned into its own little starscape of uh, these um, animals glowing without us messing them up with their light. Uh, you mentioned a volcano. Yes. At the beginning. But no sign of an uh, undersea event? No, uh, funny you should ask. <laughs> no, but maybe. So until uh, last year, there was essentially no sign of any sort of undersea hydrothermal venting. The farthest south hydrothermal vent was just discovered two years ago, and it's up off the South Sandwich Islands, which is um, right around the Arctic Circle. It's about 60 degrees south, plus or minus. Uh, this last time, we actually saw a large bacterial mat, which is what you would expect at a bacteria or a methane seep, or a hydrothermal or a methane seep forming in an area that's never been seen, even though we've been diving there, not me personally, but since the late 60s. So there may be something actually creating a new chemosynthetic seep, potentially as a function of this hydrothermal activity from this active volcano. Um, we don't know. Got a proposal in to study it. <laughs> Hopefully you can come back in three to four years and I can tell you all about it. Are there possibly any effects of the human habitation there at McMurdo on the seafloor? 
That was actually that question, what impacts the human habitat, inhabitants have on the seafloor was what got me there in the first place. Because uh, the Antarctic is thought of as this pristine environment. Uh, it wasn't until 2001 and 2002 when they really got good at it that McMurdo Station, which has 1,000 people, 1,100 people in the summer, had sewage treatment. Until then, they were essentially pouring macerated human waste uh, out into the nearshore environment. And to put it bluntly, yes, there's a lot of impact. However, it's very localized. They stopped putting chemicals in the environment a long time before that. And so there's a huge pile that you don't ever want to swim close to. But uh, as soon as you start going farther away from that, the impact's on the scale of about 1,000 meters. Um, there's also uh, one of the sadder stories in the Antarctic is Winter Quarters Bay, which is right next to McMurdo. Uh, people have not always had the kind of consciousness about uh, environmental sensitivity. And so for a while, people would just put all their trash on the ice. Every year it would melt. And they wouldn't have to take any of their trash home. And so it's actually one of the top 10 most polluted places on the planet. And the good news is it has a very shallow sill on the bay. And so there's almost no fluid that comes in and out. And so even though it's incredibly toxic, it's very slowly getting buried and kind of kept at bay. There's been a lot of discussions about whether it's worthwhile to remediate it. However, it's a very fine silt, and it's filled with jet fuel and things that we really don't want into the wider, wider environment. And if you do get down there and you try to harness that or capture that and ship it back to the states, as people have suggested, you're much more likely to have a wide-scale disaster than you do just from having it there and kind of a reminder of we should be taking better care of the environment than this when we're in some place as pristine. We uh, dive up to 70, 80 miles away from uh, McMurdo Station. Um, within 20 miles or so, we take track vehicles. Anything larger than, longer than that, we fly in helicopters. Um, yes. What's the water movement like underneath the ice? In most, so the question is, what's the water movement like under the ice? In most places, it's very low. Um, and that's also very low in the places we dive. Because if there is any water movement, especially any significant current, we won't get in the water. So another reason that we have flags on those downlines is there have been cases where we put a flag in, we put our downline in the water, we see a flag flapping in the breeze, and we pull the, dive, the flag up and we go back to station. Because that is one of the main concerns, is if you get, do get swept away from your dive hole, that's a real concern. So we just don't dive. We don't take that risk. Um, there are areas that are on points and peninsulas that do get sweeping currents. and uh, you'll find a, a real lack of scientific data for those from divers, although we do have some very small ROVs that we can take down to do some surveys now. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that uh, in one photo of, I think you called it the one cell clam, that, and I think you said it processes dirt or something. So it's a, it's a one cell protist, um, which is a single cell organism, and it essentially is the size of a pea, and it'll just eat in the sediment and get energy that way. One of the reasons there's a people who study protists and especially foraminifera, which is a part of this group, love the Antarctic because it's an area that animals that you normally find in the deep sea, such as this, it's called Gromia as its name, can come up to the shallows and so they can get organisms that normally they have to get from 4,000 meters uh, at 20, 30 feet. So what do they eat and can they eat radioactive uh, What do they eat? They mostly eat what other things eat. So they dissolve and digest the different sorts of phytoplankton and energy that the worms would eat. As to whether or not they would eat radioactive material, I, I have to say I, I doubt it. I have no knowledge of that. But uh, they, like anything else, would just incorporate it as part of their food source and store it. But they wouldn't actually break it down or make it safe for human. Uh, for human. <coughs> What's the tidal range like? And does that vary whether it's ice free or so ice? The tides don't really care, or the ice doesn't. The tides don't really care about the ice, and you can even get uh, tides in areas with very thick ice on it. It's only about uh, two to three feet of tidal range. It's a very low tidal range. I'm not a physical oceanographer. However, talking to physical oceanographers, they say it's almost impossible to model, and so the only way to know what the tide is is you go out and look at the tide gauge, although it's getting better and better with time. Do we know, or do you have a theory, or do other people have theories about why there aren't other predators in the system, leopard seals and, and other creatures? So leopard seals are, uh, can come down when the ice breaks up, as can orcas, minke whales, and those are some of the more charismatic, although in the case of leopard seals and orcas, I think scary fauna, um, especially as a diver. However, um, they're really limited to the time when there's open leads, so they have easy access in and out. 
We do get crab eater seals for longer times of the season. The only predators that really aren't in the Antarctic that are in other locations are uh, sharks. Don't know why. There are rays, but that is one of the great questions is why there are no sharks in the Southern Ocean, in the true Southern Ocean. Uh, and then large crabs are limited to the, away from the shallow depths. We think there's some sort of enzyme that doesn't work at that temperature that, that essentially limits them. And there's been some fairly provocative studies on the peninsula region. And I should say the peninsula region of the Antarctic is one of the quickest warming places on the planet. Ross Island, where I work, the really southern areas, has not seen that warming yet, but it's a very different location. On the peninsula, they think that the water's temperature is changing by just such a small fraction of a degree, they may actually have an invasion of these crabs from the deep, because they are deep, up onto the shelf and impacting the uh, um, community in a way that's not been seen before. So there's a potential invasion of crabs. I think two more questions. And have you had seals or orcas or anything come up to you when you're diving? Uh, I've never had an orca come up to me. And the Waddell seals, although they're huge and have big teeth, uh, tend to be quite afraid of humans or confused by humans. I'll also say that it, there's nothing more humbling than seeing a seal swim by you, because we're sitting in there and gangly going slowly, kicking as hard as we can, and a seal passes you without moving at all. And so you really don't want to you know, get them angry, because they're, they're the better people in the water, uh, or better animals. Uh, however, sometimes they decide that our our dive holes are their breathing holes, and they'll be defensive of them. Uh, we walk a very, uh, we do everything we can to not influence the marine mammals there in any way. However, uh, when they do take over our dive holes, we have to convince them that there are dive holes. And thankfully, what that normally means is if we blow bubbles underneath them, they get very confused and swim away. <laughs> so that's usually all it comes down to. Every once in a while, they hang out a little bit more. and. Uh, when that happens, we just sit, watch, take as many photos as we possibly can, because they're pretty amazing looking, and just relax. Um, I've never dove with orcas. There are other people that I have down there, but uh, that's pretty much the only concern. In areas that have lots of seals, we'll often put in two dive holes. We'll have one in a hut, and then a backup one. So if the seal takes the hut hole, we just go to the other one. So we don't need to have that uh, interaction if we can at all avoid it. And last question. Where's funding come for all this research? You. Thank you. <laughs> So funding is largely taxpayer. Uh, National Science Foundation is the large funder of Antarctic research. Uh, and for a variety of different reasons, uh, the glaciology lets us learn about the past. And my studies, I hope, will help us teach us about the present and future. But it is largely National Science Foundation, as well as NOAA, uh, funds some of the work looking at potential fisheries. That is where the Antarctic toothfish fisheries have been proposed for many years. And certain uh, stocks are being harvested. So they'll keep track of that. So thank you very much for your time.